come to watch the show, Red Hood? Nah, I'm just here to kick your ass. As part of our visit to Warner Brothers Games Montreal, we got to see a lot of Gotham Knights being played, but we weren't able to go hands-on with the game ourselves, and that makes a traditional preview a little difficult. Without having had a controller in our hands, it's hard to say how combat, working through missions, or making gear choices feels. And with that in mind, this preview will be a little more structural. With the help of the game's developers, we'll walk you through how Gotham Knights is put together, revealing brand new information about the open world, how supervillains fold into the fabric of the wider game, the game's neat approach to a a night cycle, and more. As we've spoken about previously this month, Gotham Knights world is aiming to feel like a real city, with centuries of history behind it. Part and parcel with that is how truly open it is. The developers ensured that almost the entirety of their Gotham is open from the very beginning, with each of its five boroughs offering different traversal opportunities, different threats, different activities, and different characters. But the team also wanted to create the sense of a city reacting to the presence of new vigilantes hitting the streets. I would say we start off the game in a, a pretty cold version of Gotham. The police don't like you, the citizens don't like you, and over time the tone evolves because you identify major threats to the city, you can find out to a certain extent what's going on beneath the surface in Gotham, and you gradually build the confidence of the citizens. Of course, some will always be on your side, and a group of citizens called The Watch act as an informant network for the Knights, offering up missions that will help stitch their parts of the city back together, all of which will see you head out into the darkness to help bring some light back to Gotham. As it turns out, Dark Knights in training like to come out during, well, Dark Knights. Key to Gotham Knights is that it's not a game with a shifting, continuous day-night cycle. Rather, the entire game is set over consecutive nights, with new crimes emerging every evening and villain storylines progressing alongside your work to stop them. The only time you'll see daylight in the main game is inside the Knights headquarters, the Belfry, where you'll plan for what to do after the next sunset. The central loop of the game experience in Gotham Knights is what we call our Belfry loop. When you exit the Belfry, it's always nighttime. You, know, you don't have to worry about when the sun's gonna come up. But in the course of that night, you are gonna ha there are going to be some crimes that, and other activities that are happening in the streets of Gotham that are premeditated. They were predetermined by whoever was gonna commit them you know, the day before. When you complete a night of crime fighting, and it's up to the player to decide when they're done, but like it could be a case of them saying, well, I think I've hit most of the major crimes I needed to, or it could be the case of them saying, I learned what I needed to learn and now I need to go back to the Belfry to advance the story, for example, then you return to Belfry and now it's daytime. Crimes in Gotham Knights come in many forms. They can range from procedurally generated muggings right up to entire gangs running complex operations. And the more you foil, the more you'll learn about crimes to come. We wanted this concept of information scarcity. So you need to find stuff out about the city night after night. You already have a kind of activity queue that you can be tracking and deciding, okay, I think that's gonna be more important for me to take on. Maybe this is more interesting to me because it, it maps better to one of the challenges that I'm trying to complete. Or maybe this has direct impact on me finding that next chapter in the larger mystery, right? So there's a lot of different reasons why a player might choose to go after one particular crime or another. Unlike the game's checkpointed story missions, if you fail a crime, there's no opportunity to replay that exact situation again. It's all part of the superhero learning process. Once you end a night, crimes are reset. That night is over, the crimes that you didn't solve continued unabated, and now you're in a situation where you can look at what's coming up for the next night, so maybe you've collected enough clues that, you've been, that you're gonna know in advance, oh, there's gonna be a heist at the bank, or there's gonna be an armored car robbery, or they're gonna, someone's gonna try to break somebody out of prison. You know, in addition to that, there's a bunch of things you don't know about, right? There's all of the other crimes that haven't been revealed, and you can find out about them through patrolling. It's a system designed to keep offering new ideas without feeling inauthentic to how a real city might work. But of course, in a comic book city, not all crimes are created equal. Sometimes in your nightly patrols, you'll stumble across information that points to a much bigger, more recognizable threat. Did you miss me? 
we were shown precisely nothing of the game's main story campaign after its tutorial. The team clearly wants to keep its take on the beloved Court of Owls storyline as clandestine as the group itself, but the game's villain storylines aren't necessarily a part of that darker conspiracy. Like any good comic book world, multiple supervillains are running riot across Gotham simultaneously, each with their own agendas. In Gotham Knights, that means that supervillain arcs are optional side stories, taking place over multiple nights, and made part of the open world itself, not just story dungeons. As you learn more about the villains taking on specific missions along the way, your Belfry evidence board will begin to grow, connecting clues to evidence and eventually letting you trigger what the team calls a villain knight. You know, when we talk about villain knights, we, we sometimes refer to them as epic villain crime, and it's because we always wanted the villains to be menacing Gotham City. We didn't want it to be a case of, oh, I'm going to go into this sort of bubble dungeon universe and Gotham somewhere else, and I'm just engaging with them here. And sometimes that means we do some fundamentally you know, big changes, right? We like encase Elliot Center in ice. In the case of, you know, one of the later missions in the Harley Quinn arc, Gotham City Hospital is, is going to be, you know, invaded and is, is going to be thrown into chaos. While it's very possible that these optional arcs could illuminate the main storyline somehow, the impression we got is that these standalone villains are there to enrich the sense of Gotham as a true comic book city with multiple threats to stave off at one time. And that applies to the town's gangs as well. As we've talked about before, Gotham Knight's factions aren't just goons for a supervillain, although they certainly can be. Instead, they populate the city themselves, causing various flavours of mayhem depending on their affiliation. So far we've seen the freaks and the regulators, and some of our footage has made mention of Red Hood's hatred for the mob. Hey look, more scumbag looking for a beat. This feeling of criminal elements spreading across the city is intended to get across the endlessness of the superhero's job. You're not able to wipe out a faction from the map, you're simply stymieing their work. You can clean Gotham of crime for a night, but you can never stop it. Even Batman wasn't capable of that, and neither are you. Practically, that means there will always be crimes to fight and combat to be had, but factions also provide another service. Each one is tied to specific gear, crafting materials, and other unlocks which will use to beef up your heroes. We've covered Gotham Knight's many, many superhero suits previously, but that was very much from the cosmetic angle. From a more gameplay-driven angle, players will be able to craft gear that alters their hero's armor, melee, and ranged items, offering stat boosts and elemental damage changes. Crafting that gear comes down to two things, having the blueprint and the materials to make it. All of the gear is created through crafting. There are flavors of gear, and it applies in slightly different ways to suits and melee weapons and ranged weapons, but what they kind of have in common is this focus on these elemental damage types. Cryogenic, freezing damage, thermal damage, electrical damage, poison, stun, these kinds of things. And those interactions should become doubly interesting by introducing another player into the world. From day one, the Gotham Knights team has made clear that its take on two-player co-op is completely untethered, meaning one player can theoretically explore another's world without ever having to meet them. Anytime you're playing in Gotham City as opposed to inside a story dungeon as part of one of the beats of the main mystery of the storyline, you're untethered. It also provides the most organic kind of superhero meetup opportunity where you think your buddy is with you and then he disappears for a while because he got distracted by something and you found a collectible. And then a second later you look up on a rooftop and a batarang comes out of nowhere and here's Batgirl and she's here to help you stop a crime. Of course, this could throw up issues of how progression works for players and how players at different parts of the story can interact. The solution is elegantly unfussy. Characters of different levels will scale so that they somewhat match, enemies will also scale to the player's levels, and most importantly, progression matters to the host and the guest. When you're in Gotham, the host is their story but 100% of your hero progression is your own. And then once you return to your own Gotham, time essentially restarts in your own story. If you completed a major story beat, a villain arc, dungeon against the Court of Owls while playing with a friend, when you get to that part in your own story, the game will ask you, do you want to play it again? Or do you want to just kind of say, you did this part in some other universe and we'll just fast forward you through it. But despite watching hours of the game being played live, there was a lot we weren't allowed to see. The game's main story missions are still a mystery to us, even down to how they're unlocked or displayed on the map. More intriguingly, the team repeatedly made reference to an endgame for Gotham Knights, but steadfastly refused to talk about it. Given the game's action RPG structure, it wouldn't be hugely surprising to find that it included an MMO-style raid of some kind, or, with a focus on the open world as an evolving space, if Gotham itself was materially transformed by the effects of the Court of Owls. We just don't know right now. But the biggest outlier for us is in how the game feels to play. 
for an extended period of time. Combat certainly looks interesting, perhaps a tad heavier than the Arkham series it will be compared to, and with a much bigger focus on using special abilities you've earned along the way. Getting around the city, whether by parkour, grappling hook, bike, fast travel paradrops, or the hero's unlockable abilities, feels like a genuinely fun first affair as well. But Gotham Knights will live and die on how these things string together, and how those smaller moments make its larger structure, those nights of patrols, crime fighting, and clue gathering, feel as compulsive as the team hopes for. There's no doubting the enthusiasm and belief at the studio, but this game will be made by how it feels once it's finally allowed to be in our hands. This marks the end of our month of IGN First content, but if you want to go all the way back to the start, we've got 16 minutes of the opening gameplay from the game. We've also got a big feature on how the team made a brand new version of Gotham City. Thank <laughs> you.